there's no title for this talk, but I'm okay with the title that was given to it. This is definitely or vaguely something that I do. This is a portrait of Nahla Haidus, killed in what was known locally as the Kana massacre, when the Israeli army bombed a UN compound where civilians were sheltered in 1996, April 1996. The photograph as you see it here is a reproduction of an actual framed picture that was in fact placed by Nahla's family on the mass grave of more than a hundred civilians held at the location of the bombing. On the surface of the picture, the family, as you see, the family as, uh, of the victim put plastic flowers around Nahla's face to cover her hair. She did not wear the scarf in her youth when the picture was taken, but she wore it at an, at an older age. And for the family, it was considered inappropriate that Nahla appears in public had uncovered. Such a photograph is a perfect example of a mode of production and an aesthetic that evolved out of urgency and that was totally shaped by local traditions. This may not be perfectly vernacular photography, but it is indeed vernacular something not far from photography. It's a vernacular assemblage of photographic elements that generate a complete piece of portraiture. This particular photograph and the story behind it were researched by Lebanese journalist Doha Shams in May 1996 while working on Mulhaq al-Suwar, a supplement of El Safir published in June 26, 19, uh, June 26 1996. <clears throat> This issue of a Safir remains a, r a rare instance in the Lebanese press when a tragic event like this one was commemorated not through photographs of the event itself, but through a secondary photographic production that evolved very quickly within days of the event. Consciously, therefore, the, the mulhaq is consciously exploring the vernacular and its ability to provide insight into a poor rural community that remains, if not victim of an assault, almost absent from public sphere. My proximity to Doha back then, while researching these photographs, at times when the discussion about the, cre the possible creation of the Arab Image Foundation made AIF co-founder Samer Madad propose to Doha to present this research to the photographic encounters of Arl. And this is how this body of work became officially the Arab Image Foundation's first exhibition in 1997, curated by Samer himself and researched by Doha Shams. My interest in this picture today goes beyond the scope of the research and the exhibition in question. I am taking this specific document, following up on its reproduction and its subscription into the IAF collection as a way to illustrate my own interest in pursuing multiple affiliations of photographic documents. You see there's a slight difference between this and that. Zooming out of the document, away from the document a little bit, and the document is already a reproduction of another uh, document, reveals a bit more of what it really is. You see a thin shadow to the left, meaning that the reproduction has been placed behind mount. And when you zoom a little bit further, zoom out a little bit further, you see that the reproduction might have been framed. And another step away reveals a simple golden frame, very popular and very common in Lebanon and probably in the world. When Doha Shams met with the families of the Qana victims with the exhibition at Arl in perspective, she asked them to reproduce duplicates or to produce duplicates of the framed photographs they had installed at the mass grave. But this one was trickier to reproduce than others because it involved the flower, the flowers, and 
possibly, which which would possibly need it, we need to be reapplied again on another uh, frame. So the family asked the only local photographer in town to simply make a picture of the framed photograph with the flowers on it, crop the frame out, and reframe the picture. So the result is a reproduction of a framed picture, cropped, reframed to look as close to the original as possible. But taking further distance away from the subject reveals this four by five inch Kodak reversal transparency that is a record of an institutional practice, clearly. On one hand, a necessity also while receiving exhibitions on loan, but also a necessity for a press kit in pre-digital times. This framed picture was reproduced in Arles, I think, in 1997, and the IF got all the reproductions back when the exhibition was returned end of summer. The reproduction was done with one source of light, as you see from the shadow. The frame is slightly tilted, as you see as well. There is a bit too much magenta, and there was no color scale used. Inside the frame of the sheet itself, over the blank space, is inscribed a number. And that's the serial number given to the object by the Arab Image Foundation. On an institutional level, and that's the IF level, what's important to bring here is that the early mission of the foundation specified that AIF was interested in photographs that were produced until the 60s. Notions of local photographic and vernacular photographic practices were further elaborated in the years that followed, but still considering photography pre-1970. This meant that members of the foundation in the seven years that followed, like myself, Fuad al Khuri, and Ito Barada, dismissed color photography and other records that might have been produced in the 80s and sometimes the 70s while looking for collections in Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Morocco, Palestine, and Jordan. The Qana portraits that you're seeing here, a sample of, researched by Doha Shams, remained an exception as a recent production, until Nigar Azimi brought to the IAF collections from Iran in 2004. The Khanna portraits remained like an atypical collection in the history of the foundation. This is why the collection was not given a number for more than a year. And this is why, despite the fact that it was one of the first collections AIF received, it finally got the collection number 113 which means that 112 collections were processed before it. Like the few collections that did not fit easily obvious categories of prints, negatives, less typical items that involved damaged and collated plates, objects, and larger fabrics of photographic material took longer time to be processed, if not remained totally unprocessed until this day. The purpose behind exploring this specific photographic item is to get hold of an item's multiple belongings to a set of practices and conventions, social, social practices, journalistic practices, curatorial, institutional, archival, and possibly artistic. And this lies in the center of my interest in studying photographs today at, as an artist, as uh, at a distance from both photographic and institutional practices. The more atypical an object is, the more challenging it is, the more engaging its story can be. From distance to objects, to practices related to them, mistakes cease to be embarrassing. When I look at photographers' mistakes, mistakes for example, that embarrassed them in the past, for me, it's so nurturing because this is how I know how they, how, how they developed. So for me, it's a source of richness. Mistakes cease to be embarrassing, but rather become enriching phenomena. And conflicts seem less dividing as they become media to give way or to give form to new work. Conventions that facilitate work and that leave traces when practiced 
over and over and over for a visual artist interested in traces, like me, interested in phenomena that take place in cool storage, they become illuminations. There are so many ways to highlight aspects of an image and make each one, each aspect uh, of them tell each time a different story. How about withdrawing, for example, the image from that? So you've seen the build-up until, until we have realized that this is actually a transparency, a reproduction of an existing uh, object. Now let's, ta let's start to selectively withdraw aspects or withdraw items from, uh, from the image. What would this frame tell us without the image? And what about withdrawing the object completely like this? What would the shadow tell us about the object that was once there and that is not anymore? And if successive withdrawal continues, what would remain? A 4x5 Kodak Ektachrome sheet, EPP 2252, as it says, discontinued in 2009? Or is it the number 113SH? And what if this Kodak sheet was no longer there? What remains maybe is the memory of a light box surface, the memory of an acid-free box in cool storage, or an after image, to borrow a beautiful title from Ziad Antar, a visual, an after image as a visual impression of a vivid sensation retained after stimulus has ceased. Like an archaeologist digging into sedimentations over time, looking for objects, but also looking to understand the practices that produced them and that might have ceased to exist, looking at how they might have functioned socially, like an anthropologist also interested in transactions by humans, individual and institutional patterns of work within a living fabric, like them I produce my work. In the framework of my most recent exhibition entitled Against Photography, which sums up spectrum of interest, a spectrum of interests triggered by photographs raised through my work over the past 20 years from figurative data, products of, products of social customs, to objects, products of photographic practices, and in an economy of image production, to the accidental hostilities towards the photographic record, product of social constraints or environmental conditions, reaching to utilizing all of those phenomena as tools while producing new documents in photography, engraving, and film. I'm going to highlight three aspects of uh, the exhibition, or like three issues raised by the exhibition against photography, the title of which, by the way, comes from an interview that I did with Mark Westmoreland and that was published in Aperture five years ago. It's a quite, uh, a, a, it's not meant to be a provocative uh, 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 title. Against something is uh, distancing, uh, let's say, distancing uh, uh, measure. Um, like you see a figure against a white background, so you see it better. Uh, it, it has to do with comparison, it has to do with scale, and it has to do with opposition as well. And I like this ambiguity within, within the title, uh, within the term against. Um, photographs are descriptions. Nobody can deny that photographs are descriptions of, um, of something. And in the exhibition there were four m main rooms and when you go in the first room you encounter that aspect of, uh, of photography. And I tried to be very much loyal to the original, to the, to the time zone of the 90s when we were discovering photographs and we were discovering, for example, the photographer's shadow. Whenever uh, Fuad al-Khuri or Ito Barada or myself found a picture where 
you saw the photographer's shadow, we kind of automatically wanted it to be part of that collection. And this is a, an example of, of, a, of a picture taken by uh, Shafi Soussi in the Maqasid school in Saida in the 50s. You see his shadow pointing actually at, uh, at the scene. Of course, his shadow is the only one there because that's, the, that's how the, the, the picture looked originally. And this is a way to intervene in the, um, in, the fic in the picture to highlight his presence, his only presence. He is the one facing the world. He is the one facing the scene. And many photographers did not know actually or n noticed it only later that maybe it's not good that the shadow of the photographer figure in, um, in the picture because it, it, um, it gave keys to unmake that picture. If you want a seamless photograph of a scene to take place, you should not, you were told, you should not have uh, the, your shadow fall in the frame. And this is how the installation looked. So there was one uh, enlargement of uh, Shafi Isusi's uh, uh, picture of the Maqasid school where you, see, where you saw only his, his shadow. And then a close-up um, uh, photographs of close-ups of so many pictures where you saw only the shadows of the photographer. And you realize they look so much alike, even though they came from different places, from different sources, from different modes of production, from different countries and different dates. The other, uh, the other issue that inhabited me for long uh, uh, in, in, in the 90s, and was, I was never able to address it properly because every time, especially when I, when I did uh, Cairo portraits, which, was, which ended up actually being portraits of the privileged class uh, in, in Egypt because no one, no one could, could afford paying Van Leo or Armand or, or, or Alban unless you are coming from a, uh, from a privileged background. And I started looking for photographs of servants. And you see this, this is a photograph taken in, in Egypt by Riyad Shahata um, in the 40s. So this is, also, this is Egypt under the, royal, the, royal, the royal royalty. And uh, on top right, you see a ghost. And if you look well, he is actually a ghost that looks like the other servant on the far left but there was an attempt to remove him out of the picture. And it's this kind of absence that uh, made his figure so uh, visible, actually. And this is a close-up of, of the ghost. So again, in my work, how do you make sense out of it and how do you produce another another image or another work that is so much informed uh, of those pheno phenomena. This is a typical picture of a family at the pyramids. The family uh, members are on riding camels and behind them, beautiful scene of the Sphinx and the pyramids. I'm sure hundreds of thousands of pictures like this one exist in the world whoever visited the pyramids in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s have to, had to have something like that. This is the original picture mounted on a cardboard. And you see, if you zoom into the picture, you see that actually the photographer naturally measured the light based on the people riding the camel and not did not really care uh, for properly exposing his picture to have the faces of the servants properly uh, shown. It's a basic exercise for photography when you have black skin and white skin put next to one another. You need to illuminate the scene in in careful ways to have both rendered properly. And what I've done is I produced this image and most of the people who passed by did not notice anything, although I have actually sprayed acrylic on the faces of the servants and nobody thinks, like you can hardly see it. 
So in a way, I wanted to accentuate that absence. Then in the next room, you don't see photographs anymore in the traditional sense. I've been for long inspired by this situation. This is a collection, this is a collection or these are two glass plates from a collection of a known studio in Alexandria called Studio Rory. I brought this collection in 1998 when I visited Alexandria and the studio nowadays is owned by uh, the family of Shaban Abdel Hamid. And the studio actually inherited uh, the archive of Shaban's predecessor, so uh, Garbis Nazaristisyan, an, an Armenian uh, photographer who started practicing in the 20s. And these are glass plates from the 40s two glass plates of different sizes st stacked on one another emulsion side in. So with the, with the humidity, uh, they were stuck one onto another. And for me, like a not so serious researcher back then in the 1990s, I tried to take them, like to break them apart, like right on site. And this is what happened. So this is the image of the two uh, glass plates stuck one onto another and after they were removed the smaller plate actually helped preserve uh, the larger plate and it's for me it's, this is so poetic um, it's it highlights absence it highlights the fact um, that's this plate went through something that's not very clear what it is, but it carries the trace of it. That's something else, also observing uh, plates that were stuck one to another. But these photographs are permanently um, stuck, no, I mean, until now nobody made the attempt of, uh, of remo removing them. Um, this is the collection of Mohsin Yamin, Tripoli-based uh, collector, who collected a lot of um, the remains of photographic studios in Tripoli and in Zgarta. Uh, what I like about, I mean, these are close-ups of details from the glass plates, and it's a series called Faces to Faces, Every time you see a French soldier from uh, the Vichy regime stuck on a photograph of a civilian from Tripoli. And I'm interested in how these two categories share the same space. They probably did not share the same space in the city. There were little contacts between them but they shared the space of the photographer because you have to go to a photographer if you need a portrait of, your, of yourself to be made. And as a soldier who wanted to send pictures to his family, you need to visit a local photographic studio. And what happens with a phenomena that one cannot control? What happened here is, for example, Anoushian's studio was flooded later after after he died, and then the owner of the studio had to evacuate all this material and put it on the street, and this is how Mohsen Yamin got hold of this collection. So faces to faces bring together the governor and the governed, and they are in a way, these are pictures that in a way, in a way um, uh, there's a fatality to them, like they have to be like this forever, unless you break them apart, and it's not sure that you will end up separating this face from that face. The body of film also explores photographs as, as matter. Antranik Bakarjian's um, photographs from Jerusalem. Antranik Bakarjian is a photographer, Armenian photographer from Jerusalem who practiced photography from the late 20s until recently. I mean, until the 70s. He died somewhere in 2001 and 2002. 
What's interesting about him is that he is one of those who decided to stay and live, un live under, under occupation. And you see through his work uh, his subject matter changing. This is, for example, 1948. Neighbors and members of his larger family sing over the rubble of their own home, his home as well. His home was bombed in 1948, so he had to take refuge to the uh, St. James Convent in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem. And he took his camera with him. So you see him before 1948 taking pictures of uh, Palestinian society out in the fields, uh, excursions to the sea, um, excursions to Jordan, to the desert. And all of a sudden in 1948, there's something that is happening. He is actually taking pictures of fortifications of the Armenian convent of Jerusalem, men filling uh, sandbags, uh, resistance fighters learning how to use machine guns, etc. This is a sample of his uh, negatives. All his negatives, negatives are 35 millimeter negatives. I took close-ups on specific uh, situations that interested me. And I'm interested in how the emulsion that carried the picture started to peel off, almost wanting to desert its support, wanting to desert the celluloid uh, film. And I took close-ups on the brands of film, Dupont nitrate film. I had this uh, had this emulsion not peel off or break in that specific way, maybe I would not have been interested in this negative. And they were, these were all produced as light boxes, and you see them in the exhibition like that. You see other brands like or other slogans, like safety film, as opposed to nitrate unsafe film. Photographs as matter, and we're also departing. The more you go in the exhibition towards the end, the more images start to disappear. I invited Factum Arte, which is a company that uh, uh, does 3D um, uh, recording of surfaces. They work a lot with archaeology. They work a lot uh, in Egypt, for example. They duplicate um, uh, tombs in, in Upper Egypt. So tourists would no more visit the actual tomb, they would visit a replica of, of it. And to build a replica, you have to uh, um, reproduce, you have to record everything, image and relief, and reproduce them. And in order to produce image and re relief, you use two cameras, a reproduction camera for images and color, and another camera for relief. And I asked uh, Factum if we can use only the camera that records relief. So in other terms, I like to call it a blind camera. It's a camera that does not see images, sees only relief. And from those recordings, we produced plates, negative plates, that were routed based on the data um, recorded from the negative. These are negatives that went through channeling, developed also all sorts of wrinkles. They are gelatin negatives of different sizes. And that plate allowed, allows you to reproduce the same pattern in so many different ways. And this is the piece. So you see 12 different scans. You see 12 different place, plates, aluminum plates, uh, these are the master, they are the negative, the equivalent of a negative, but in printing, in engraving, it's the master, and from each one generated four different um, prints. And each type of print, like intaglio, for example, renders surfaces better, uh, renders wrinkles better, it's the second row whereas the silver um, chine collet and the black chine collet, um, they are more monochrome. And these are the plates. 
Now, a third issue that I'm really also more and more interested in, and it's a phenomenon that takes place uh, in, in cool storage, contamination, light contamination. And this is a series that I called Undividing History. It's basically the work of Khalil Rad, a Palestinian photographer from Jerusalem, and Jacob Bendov, known as an Israeli photographer from Jerusalem as well. Both of them lived in Jerusalem pre-Israel times under the Ottoman Empire and then un under the um, uh, British occupation. Jacob Bendov is known to have made films. Uh, he worked for the Ottoman army before opening a studio in, um, um, Sorry, before, before working as a professional photographer, I don't think he had a studio. Khalil Rad opened a studio on Yafa Street, very, very known and famous uh, uh, photographer. These two photographed distinct communities. When you look at their work, you don't imagine that they actually both lived in the same time, in the same space. I produced these uh, eight photographs, four from... Khalil Rad and four from, um, from uh, Bendov. And when you look closely, uh, these are cyanotypes produced from glass plates. But the glass plates are glass plates that are contaminated plates. This is a collection that had a brief passage, passage in the Arab Image Foundation. So what we, what the foundation has as a trace is only a uh, contact print of the glass plate. What I've done is that I reproduced new glass plates based on, uh, based on uh, the contact prints, but I intervened on the glass plate to have elements from pictures by Bendov figure in the photographs of Khalil Rad and have elements from the picture of Khalil Rad figure on the plate uh, that carries images of, of Bendov. And I, I call it undividing history. Uh, this is a phenomenon, um, the, the, the contamination, the light content, let's call it light contamination, ha happened a few times. I've, uh, I've seen pictures in like the Madani collection, for example. We have pictures that were stacked onto one another, but uh, sorry, negative stacked onto one another. But if the negative is not stable, the shadow of one negative would cast, actually it's not a shadow, it's the print, it's the reverse print of one negative that falls and registers onto the other as a positive shadow. And then when you print that negative, that piece that registered as a positive renders as a negative on the positive print. So if you see, these two are a pair. Each one carries one element from the other. These two are a pair. Each one carries an element from the other. And in a way, they become insep inseparable. So the Dome of the Rock that you see repeated four times below figures on top of each one of the upper row of Bendov's uh, um, people who were photographed at the stairs of the, of the Dome of the Rock sometimes appear as phantoms in, um, in Bendov's photographs. Bendov's photographs show people doing the fields, um, a, utopian, um, a utopian modern uh, society inhabiting an empty land and Khalil Rad's photographs show us urban um, life around uh, Jerusalem, basically Arab and international uh, crowds coming in Jerusalem, visiting the Dome of the Rock. Uh, yeah, so in a way, I wanted to bring this into that and that into this. And uh, below, there's a vitrine uh, that shows you the two glass plates that are produced, one on top of another. Another uh, example of, um, or also, I'm, I'm, I'm to, I'm, I don't know if you, you noticed, I'm using uh, traces uh, of phenomena that happen in cool storage 
and try to build with them, use, use them as media, try to build with them new documents. This is a part of a timeline where I displayed six folders, six uh, empty folders, but on the jacket of the folder, you see traces of the architecture sheets of Refat Shadirji. This is, a, this is also a, a collection that's passed through the foundation for a short period. All what I'm saying here is, our, is that even, even after things disappear, they cast a shadow, they leave a trace. And this is how I interpret this uh, phenomenon. And these are a few other examples. On photography, dispossession and times of struggle is a continuating is a, is a continuation uh, like is a second chapter of on photography, people and modern times, which I produced in 2010. This one focuses on the history of dispossession of land, but also dispossession of uh, photographs. And I'm going to show you the last uh, the last part of the film, the, the the ending, just because it resonates with the idea of the after image. So I, again, I'm using the term after image as as something that continues to exist even when the object is no longer there. You still see it. You still live with its shadow, let's say, with its phantom. Um, and this is, we are going to see the collection of Nabi Halutfi, who is a dear friend passed away two years ago. Nabiha uh, was my oldest friend. Um, she died, I think, at 78 or something like that. Uh, she contributed to the collection of the Arab Image Foundation with a few photographs of her st d studies in, uh, in Cairo. And here you'll see her sister talking about her. Nabiha one day came to the foundation after she uh, donated her own photographs. She came to the foundation saying, I have something else uh, for you I would like you to keep. I said, what is this? She said, I don't know exactly what this is, but just take them. And they stayed. They were films. They, they stayed in the, in the foundation until now. Uh, and when I was working on the Madani film and I had access to a Super 8 projector, I took her film and she, she had told me that this is a f what the film is about. It's the funeral of uh, Maruf Saad, a for, uh, former Lebanese deputy who was killed in 1975. And she, had, she got hold of this funeral of this guy. She, she always wanted to do something with it. But I think she, at some point she realized that she's not going to make it and she brought it to the foundation. القاهرة بدون بجامعات مصر يعني بس بالذات القاهرة 
بدون اي امتحانات يعني بالسنوات نفسها اللي دخلوا فيها فهن ما نبيها كانت سوف عمر تقريبا فاجت لهون دغري دخلت قسم اللغه العربيه بجامعه القاهره يعني نبيها بعدين بعد ما عملت فتره دخلت درست كليه الاداب طرح عليها انه انه انت ما دام بتحبي كانت من زمان هي ناوي تروح على فرنسا تدرس فنون هيدا هي وصغيره وبعدين ما يعني كانت الاجواء كلها مش كثير تسمح بهيك مثل هلا كل الاولاد مسافرين فحتى الجامعه الامريكيه كانت بعتقد بتذكر في ثلاثه كانوا هي وصاحباتها اجوا كان هيدا شيء بالنسبه لصيدا كبير انه جامعه مختلطه وهيكونوا فيها هي ونهدى سيران ورفيقه بنت صاحبتهم يعني صايره انا بنسى الاسماء معلش آه هي بالجامعه طبعا هي تعرفت على الدكتور علي مختار هون وكان هو عم يدرس طب وصار في علاقه بيناتهم بس قبل فكرت هي انه ليه ما قالوا لها ليه ما بتدخلي واحد من اصدقاء اللي كثير كثير يعني ناقده وادبي قال لها انت ليه ما بتروحي بتدخلي معهد السينما فراحت دخلت مع معهد السينما كان اول بنت بتدخل معهد السينما في مصر ما كانش في حدا ثاني كان مصطفى لما عمل صور والاشياء اللي كانت في الجنازه والسنايبر دعاوى وكذا وهذا فقال نبيها انا حابعت لك الماده كلها لاني بهمني تحفظ في اماكن امنيه اذا بتتذكر بس مش هي اللي بعتت بمعنى ما كانت يعني ما كانت بهذيك الفتره مش بتزقن على تاريخيا مش بتزقن لان هي سنه ال 75 يعني كانت وقت حرج جدا هيدا الصور كلها الجنازه والسيناريو هيدا اللي فيها كله هيدا كان مثل ما قلت لك انبعت لها كانش هي ما كانتش يعني ما عندهاش كان برنامج فيلم مع معروف سعد بلحظتها لا الفيلم اللي قتلت معروف سعد هي اللي جابت هيدا الالمان مش يعني مش هي كانت ناوية تصور فصورتها بس انبعثت إلا على أساس إنه على أساس إنه يعني تبركن عمل الفيلم يعني مهم من الأساس هو إنسان جماهيري من النوع ده هيدا هلا شو مفهوم يعني جماهيري فوضوي أو منظم هذا شيء تاني بس عم نحكي إنه هو بالأساس علاقته بالناس كانت كتير قوية معروف سعد لفوه بالعلم الفلسطيني لانه هو كان من الناس اللي كانوا يدخلوا بعمليات لفلسطين هو من من بدايات المقاومه كان الى فلسطين فلذلك اعتبروه انه هو من جماعه من شهدائه فلفوه بالعلم الفلسطيني ما له علاقه قبل النائب 
هو نائب لما كبر هو صغير كان يدخل لما كان استاذ كان كل وقت يدخل على فلسطين وانا بعرف عن خالي الله يرحمه ابو سعيد كان يشتغل معه فترة عرفت كيف ف يعني كانوا مجموعة يفوتوا ويطلعوا لهم صور كثير ما بعرف اذا جبتها انت لهم صور كثير بالدخول وبالعمليات وكذا The last scene that you see uh, uh, repeating, uh, for those of you who know this, uh, who these three are, Kamal Jumblat on his left, on, uh, in the center is uh, the son of Maruf Saad, Mustafa Saad, who was uh, uh, targeted with an explosion in 1983 uh, that left him blind. He lived until the 90s. He died somewhere in the, in the 90s. Kamal Jumblat on his Right, who was killed in 1976, so one year after after that, uh, and the one on the right is George Howey, who was killed in 2005 or 2006 in a car ambush in uh, in Beirut. This is why I wanted to bring this in in the end, like a, like an after image. Thank you. <laughs> 